Hey, this is Paul Sinenko, and welcome to Learn Digital X5 channel. This week, we're talking we're talking about REST calls. We're going to take a look at how to make REST calls from your client side to external resources to get you data for the application. So uh, we're going to learn how to construct a header, uh, how to construct the body of the request, uh, how to send it out, and how to parse the data back into something useful we can actually uh, employ in our application. So this is going to be uh, packed with uh, information and should be a fun one. So buckle up, and I'll see you on the other side. All right, so we're here at the controls, and let's explore what it takes to make an API call. REST API call, to be precise in this case. So the tools to do that, you'll find, as same place you find most of the tools, is in your data flow. So let's jump to a data flow. Um, and the block that we need is called string loader. Here, let me just remove the search query. Or search for str. Then this is what I want. This is a block to simply get a web resource. Right? Um, to upload, for example, some data to the file system here, you would use string uploader, but we're not gonna cover that today. Uh, what we want is string loader. So the most basic use for string loader is to load a file. For example, let's see if I have any assets I want to, well, I don't have any text assets, but I do have, uh, uh, actually, I do. Uh, we can load any of the DG5s since it's just a JSON file. So let's look at here, this index. So I'm just going to use this as a path for the string loader. All right? And my output is literally the JSON. It just reads the file, the text file, and uh, gives me an output. Uh, I can even parse it here using JSON parser. Right. And well, of course, you need some parsing rules. Um, I'm not going to get too far into this. Um, this is just an illustrated point. So um, let's delete that. Oops. Now let's move on. So let's look at making uh, what, what it takes to make a call. Right. So we already saw that you need a path. In this case, this is a local path, so a path to a file in your file space here. Uh, this can be also a web resource path, right? So it doesn't have to be local. Next, uh, headers, right? We all know headers, um, and we'll take a look at the formatting of headers. Um, the call type, post, get, put, delete, nonce, and so on. Um, and then you get response outputs, right? You get a status, headers, output, so on. You can pick to send cookies if uh, authorization is involved. And we'll briefly take a look at uh, basic authorization um, and how to use that um, as well. Okay, so you know this is self-explanatory. Once you have it all filled out, you simply invoke to make that call. Uh, if it's auto run, it will issue a call basically on any change of any of those fields. If it's not auto run, uh, then it'll make a call whenever you invoke. Yeah, well. Simple enough. So what we want to do is um, make a few calls, right? Uh, so what I did is I found some API we can use. Uh, they're Yahoo Finance API, basically stocks, and we can use those to try and get some data and take a look at what what happens. So I'm gonna switch to um, let's switch to basically uh, my API documentation here. And we're going to make a few calls. So these are all various APIs we can run. Right? Um, and let's try to get a market summary. So here it is uh, market slash get summary. Right? And uh, we have rules over here of uh, what we need. Right? So the endpoint is fixed. Uh, and so let's start with that. So let's go ahead and copy the endpoint. And what I'm going to do is rather than just paste it in the path right away, I'm actually going to create uh, a 
constructed path so that we can easily then replace the actual endpoints. So this goes here, right? And if we switch back, right? So then our path is market slash summary, right? Uh, so let's see if we can copy this from somewhere. Yeah, here. Market slash summary. So let's put a slash at the end here. Like so, and I think this is HTTPS if memory serves. There, and now we have a full path. So let's go ahead and link it to uh, to our path. And, and let's try to do it now. Let's see what happens. Okay, we get 401, right? missing application key. That's expected. We have no headers, right? So we didn't basically tell it that we have the right to pull this data. So let's keep moving. So what do we have here? So we have API key, and this is a one-time key that I got issued um, for this free service. And um, you know, these these are the headers. So we need those things in the header. So let's add this key to the header. So I'm gonna copy the key name and go into my header and go pop it out so it's a little bit bigger, paste it, equals. Right. And I'm gonna copy the key itself. So let's just copy it from here since it's easier to select. Right. So you can see the format here. Um, it's a little bit different in our header, right? So we don't need to use quotes or columns. Uh, we use equal sign. So just simply going to say equals to this. So that's our key in the header. Let's take a look at what else we need in the header. Uh, query string equals true, right? So we need to add that to the header. So we're going to copy this. All right, so to add another parameter to the header. I'm just going to move on to the next line, use and. That's our uh, new header parameter equals true. That should be enough. And let's give it another shot. There we go. Look, we are getting some data. So now we have data. We need to go ahead and try to parse it. So to parse it, and this is JSON, obviously. To parse it, we're going to start with JSON block, right? In many cases, you can use JSON block to parse what you need. Sometimes your JSON is too complex or has too many nested uh, components where you actually have to use a script block and go through the object kind of in the script and just get what we need. So we'll try JSON parser first. So if I just simply bind uh, our JSON in here, what I get is not very useful, right? Because it just tries to parse the top very object, which is a market summary response. Uh, and uh, there's not much in there. So let's try to add uh, a selector to this. So it's gonna, I'm gonna try to get this. And then dot result, right? You, you can see that result is the first object inside the market summary response object. All right, and let's see what that gets us, right? That's a lot more like what we're looking for. So here we have markets, right? And you know, market changes and so on, right? So we were able to obtain uh, data from Yahoo Finance API, um, and we got the market uh, market movement summary. Previous close, and so on, right? So. Um, and in this case, this is not an issue, but um, there can be a case where your cross domain uh, is not configured on your target server, and it simply does not allow you to make the call from the client. What this means is because you know because you your application is hosted at a certain URL, right? And to make a data request from another URL, the cross domain settings, the cores settings, have to allow that. Um, if they don't, um, you may need to figure out another way to make this call in such a way that it's not cross-domain, right? So that it's made rather than being made from the client 
uh, machine, uh, you can make it make the call from the server. So we're going to take a look at uh, how that works. Now this only works in DSA. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look. So right now we're making a call to this uh, resource here. So I'm going to go ahead and copy our resource. And before you can make calls to this resource using a DSA proxy directly from the server, right, we need to add it to uh, our list of proxies. So we're going to go to sys in our data tree. Again, only relevant for DSA situation. Uh, if you're working with Nagger version or uh, something else, you probably will not have this ability. Um, then you're going to have to refer to your own server um, on how to do this. So we're going to go to sys and going to find course proxy rules. Right? I'm going to set this. I'm going to open, uh, well, I can just make it bigger and add it to the end. Um, they need to be comma separated, right? But to add a new line character in this editor, I actually have to do out enter. Or I can pop it out like this. And then I can do enter, paste this new path. Right, do slash store, meaning like any anything starting with this path is fair game. Um, this is the trick though. If you simply do apply OK, nothing's gonna happen because what you what you see is the original set menu has already gone away. Uh, so nothing's gonna get executed. So what I need to do is copy this and close this box, go to set again, and I'll select everything, paste, and then invoke. Right, so now my cores rules, basically my proxy rules, um, will allow that URL. To use that, right, to make a call, not from the client, but from the server, right, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this following syntax, dot dot slash p, and then question mark, and then the rest of the URL. This forces the call to be made rather than going from the client, which is where this page is loaded, to this resource. It's going to make the server make the call, right? And this page will look to its own server, DSA server, to fetch the data, right? So as we make the call, you see nothing changed. We still got the response, but except the difference is now the call is not being made from the client. So as far as this API server is concerned, it got a call from, from your DSA server, not from the client on which this web page is loaded. Right? Uh, so this is something, this is a tool for you to go around course issues, right? When, uh, if you get an error, I think it's Fort, uh, no. Man, I can't remember. Actually, we can, we can test it out. I do have uh, a URL can make a call to and actually get across the main error. Yeah, stream loader. Uh, so let's try to make a call to actually 20. There we go. Okay, so this is a typical indication that a call is not allowed to go through, right? You get zero status, basically no response, you get error. Right? This means uh, course headers rejected this, right? It didn't allow it to go through. This can also happen when you try to hit HTTPS resources from HTTP page and a few other issues, right? However, I, I already have this path in my course headers. Um, so if we take a look at what's there now, Right, it's uh, right here, right here, right? So, which means if I try to make the same call using your proxy, right? I'm still gonna get an error because this is not a valid API server, but it, you know, but now the call made it all the way through and I got a response, it's 500, right? I got an error message. So basically now I'm seeing the data back from the server where without the proxy, I wasn't even able to get to the server at all. It just my request just is not allowed to go across the network. Okay, so this is kind of a little sidestep here. Um, nevertheless, um, so we learned how to make a REST call and get some data back. Now we can actually try to um, populate our little project 
Um, so I'm going to copy this because this will be useful. And let's go to the project we've started a few lessons ago. Um, here, right here, if you recall, we built this menu. Right. Um, well, now let's uh, let's populate this menu with some data. So let's get back to our API page and find something interesting we can um, create a menu out of. So let's go to stocks, and we can get uh, let's see news holders. Uh, somewhere in here, there were so we to get movers. Basically, we get stocks that uh, made the most movements. Oh yeah, get movers here. So market slash get movers. So let's use that to get a list of that we're going to use to populate the menu. All right. So here, we're going to go in here to our navigation. Uh, we're going to add another group uh, under the header. Just blow it up. Right click. We're going to paste our little API setup in here. Right. And uh, the call we're going to make, so we don't need a proxy, so I'm going to remove that. Um, and this was we get movers. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, those are our movers. Um, now our parser will not work because our parsing selector was from a prior call which didn't have these objects. But this one seems like has finance and result is what we need. So let's try this. Finance result. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is almost what we need. So this gives us three categories of movers, right? So um, looks like we have day gainers, day losers, and most actives, right? And but we need data sets within those. Um, now, if we looked at the actual, actual JSON, we would see that the uh, there are sub arrays there of data. Um, in order for us to dig deep enough to get those, I'm just going to put star in the drill down filter. What that should do is get us nested tables. There you go. Now we have a nested table of criteria, and I think there's something else. Yeah, and quotes. Quotes is what we want. All right. So now we have three nested tables. It just parsed inner objects into tables as well. So we have kind of table of tables, which is perfectly fine. So uh, we're going to use basically join, maybe just use, let's use one of these tables to drive our uh, menu. So let's use day gainers. Uh, so it's going to be number one, but we're not going to rely on its first position. What I'm going to do is filter this table. Uh, right. uh, I'm going to filter it for title um, and just make it smaller so we can see this uh, day gainers dash us uh, in quotes All right so this gives us one uh, one row All right and now we need this table so I'm gonna just grab a table object from here and scroll down to quotes and just simply bind this cell right to our table. Uh, it has something like this. Um, so we see that, uh, so we have exchange code, we have some dates. Um, somewhere in here there was also, aha, uh -huh, there's a symbol. All right, so we're going to list these symbols. Um, yeah, we're going to use that. So, but but we I also want to, yeah, we'll make them clickable and maybe obtain more information um, on when you select a symbol. Okay, and there's 
probably nothing. Oh, there might be some more nested data that uh, we could be using here, but uh, I don't probably don't want to get any deeper into this. Okay, so we need to build uh, a repeater, right? If you this is going to go back to lesson one, based on this table, a uh, single line item will just show us the symbol name and it's going to be selectable. So let's let's get to it. Um, so I'm going to add, well, first, let's call this um, navigation list, nav list. Um, this is going to be a vertical layout, of course. And I'm going to add a single item in here. Right, we'll call it uh, nav item. I'm going to first blow it up just so everything gets set and then go back and just change the height to, I don't know, 50 pixels. No, too much, 40. Yeah. Um, also, I don't want to shrink it at all uh, because I want scroll bar to appear if it has to appear instead of shrinking each item to fit. And speaking of scroll bars, I'm going to go to my nav list and just set them right away. Uh, so vertical scrolling is going to be auto and uh, make scroll bars a little bit smaller. No fill. Um, let's make him blue-ish. And three pixels outline. There we go. Okay, so nav item. Um, so the item itself is going to be horizontal with vertically center aligned. Uh, a little bit space from the start top uh, from left and right. Um, and it's going to contain text. Um, text is going to be dark gray. Uh, it will not have any offsets so that it's positioned by the item itself. And that's enough for now to create a symbol, convert to a symbol or have item. Uh, get right back into it. And create a property called label and bind this property right to my text. Done. Okay, so now I'm going to delete this from here because remember I need a repeater. I don't need an item to actually sit there. Um, I'm going to switch to repeater. I'm going to find my data as a source. Now I'm going to go to that symbol that I just created. And I only deleted it, its instance whenever I didn't delete the actual symbol I created. So it's still here under my symbols. I'm going to use that as a symbol for my repeater. Right? And I'm going to open my table, switch to my render, which now shows my label property. And I'm going to bind the symbol column to my label. Okay. And there we go. So now I have a list of... Uh, Stocks, um, they're not selectable yet. So let's take care of that as well. And so I'm gonna go inside. I'm gonna use this selected property to drive visual changes. So I'm gonna say stroke, I'm gonna bind selected property to fill, right? It's gonna be a Boolean. I'm gonna say when it's true, when it's selected, I'm gonna make this uh, blue. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be white, right? And for the text, I'm going to do the same thing. Control, by now holding control, and it's command on Mac. Uh, when I let go, this gives me a dialog, right? Uh, this is what the binding dialog is. Uh, again, it's a Boolean mapping. And when it's true, text is going to be dark gray. When it's false, um, Sorry, when, when it's selected, text is going to be white. When it's false, not selected, text is going to be dark gray. And done. Okay. Now I'm going to change my cursor to be hand type. And, and now the last thing I need to do is to create event on which this gets selected. Now I can use the selection uh, settings of the, of the repeater group itself. If you recall, right? Uh, we'll go to selection, right? So I can enable, enable selection here. Uh, however, I prefer to do it from the inside out. So I'm going to add in my symbol 
I'm going to add a state block. All right. I'm going to add one item to it, and it's going to be affecting my selected property. Not important. Select the property of my root group. All right. And it's going to set it to true. I don't want it. I don't want it serialized, so I'm going to turn the serialization off. All right, and it's going to be driven by click. Done. Okay, so now we should be able to select. Okay, so now next thing is we need to obtain our selection. So somehow we need feedback that gives us what we've selected. And that part is extremely easy. Close this. Um, I'm going to find a book called Select Rows. And when I drop it onto my repeater data flow, it's already pre bound. Again, there's, there's nothing special about these bindings. They're just there to, you know, to speed things up. But you, it's the same thing as you taking the table, binding it to the input, and then taking the index of a selected item, which is this selected index, and binding it to the indices. And that returns a row that's currently selected. So, right, as I select items, you see this outputs a row of what has just been selected. Next, let's get some more information about what's been selected. So we have a stock symbol, right? There should be an API to get details about that stock. So let's head back to our API list. And uh, let's see, get details, deprecating. Is there another, um, how about get insights? That's interesting, let's get insights about that stock um, maybe financials and insights so to get financials no that's too much information i don't want to get whole financials um i want to get just a quote maybe get news It's category, we want news about specific stock. Um, okay, well, let's use this deprecating API. I guess it's not deprecated yet. Uh, so until it gets deprecated, let's try to use it. Okay, so here, so this is the, the path, right? Uh, stock slash get detail. So I'm just gonna copy that, uh, switch back. I'm going to copy this whole, uh, this whole setup. Actually, I'm going to cut it from here. And I'm going to now move on to my main area and do it there. OK, so this is our endpoint minus the slash. All right. Um, now we need to construct the header, and this time the header is not going to be static. So until now, our header was just a just fixed value. Now our header is going to have to include um, the symbol that we select. Actually, is it a header? Oh, I might be wrong. It may not be a header. Okay, sorry. It's uh, query parameters. So our header remains static. Um, and it's going to have three things that it already has, I believe. Uh, yes, um, uh, so we query parameters, so that's what we need. So these are the query parameters that we need to add region, language, and then symbol. So let's switch back. Now query parameters are something that's added to the end of the URL. And um, I'm going to do a separate maybe replace block for query parameters. I'm going to say... Um, uh, was it region equals and then uh, basically placeholder then and language equals 
placeholder and symbol equals placeholder. Okay, now we're going to go down here and replace our placeholders with actual values. Now, region is going to be fixed. We don't have it coming from any selections. Uh, language will also be fixed because that's not coming from any selections either. It's just always English for us. Uh, however, the symbol, right, that guy will be parameterized. Oops, so it's not symbol. We we'll used sim. My bad. So sim would come from the selection of this menu. So let's go ahead and grab the selection from here. So we're going to go into this uh, selected rows, open this table, go back to our content. Right? And we're going to bind this symbol into here. So now we have dynamic query parameters that include currently selected symbol. So I'm going to go ahead and add one more uh, input to our concat block and use our query parameter string in it. Uh, so now the full path, all right, if you look at it, it includes the, the URL plus query parameters. And uh, that should be enough to get the data. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. We got the data, right? But it's not going to be parsed correctly, so we have to fix the parser, right? So our default key statistics. Actually, so in this case, uh, you know, this JSON probably has a lot of stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this whole JSON. I'm going to go to my JSON editor that I prefer, right? Paste it here, parse it into a tree, and go through to see. Uh, what I want, right? So this just gives me the whole structure of the, of the response. And I'm going to take a look. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here, as you can see, and uh, I only need a few details. Uh, well, for example, this is a company info. We could use that. So summary profile. So let's see if I can parse for summary profile. Okay, all right, so this gives me company data. Cool, I can use to populate it. So I'm gonna use another JSON parser to get other data. So I'm gonna switch back here and keep exploring. Price. Um, let's see, regular markets open. So price.regular market open is basically, okay, so that's open price. Boy, there's a lot of stuff here. So there's a market change, market open. So I'm gonna let me try to parse the whole price section and see if we can get nested objects. And so we'll get something like this. All right, and yeah, this is uh, this is good. It says volume market open. Day high. Somewhere in here, there's probably current price. Regular market, previous close. New market, regular market price. I think this, our previous close. These are the lows. There it is. So that's the current price. Well, wow. okay, that's a, that's a good gain if I read this correctly. Anyway, so this has what we want. So these two tables basically give us what we want. So let's go ahead and use them to create some content. So first, uh, let's use the company info table. And I'm, again, I'm not going to get too uh, creative here. Uh, we'll just drop some texts to show the, some of this information. All 
right, so our company, uh, so company name, business summary. Where's the business name? That's interesting. It's got everything but the business name. Okay, so be it. We'll just show the market summary. Um, Got to make sure that it's wrapped. Okay, maybe a smaller font. Okay, cool. So underneath that, um, we probably need some spacing here. Let's do 20 pixel vertical spacing. All right, so we can, I don't know, let's just do website. I mean, you, you can see that we can add the whole address and whatever. We'll just do website. All right. Um, that's fine. So, and now let's show the stock info. Um, so I'm just going to duplicate this and I need a concat because this is going to be a label value type deal. So I'm going to say concat. So the market open. All the way back here for market open here. Market open, regular and raw. Now let's let's use rounded. I think that's a difference. Okay, so we're gonna bind this cell here. All right, and that I'm going to go in here. I'm gonna duplicate. Go to this one. Say day high. And get another one. So one here that was day low. There's a day low. Let's open this data flow here. Day low. And finally, current market price. Regular market price. There you go. So open this data flow. Now, one thing I would like to mention is normally, if I wasn't built this within a constraint of, uh, of a lesson, um, what I would be doing, of course, is creating symbols that um, allow would allow me to reuse this quite a bit faster. Um, so, but since we're not focusing in that area of learning right now, we're just trying to get our API populated as soon as we can. Okay, so we're fine. The only thing that's missing is our block, our to get data, our stream load is not set to run on change, meaning that it will not rerun when you reselect something. So I'm going to enable auto run. This will make it basically update on change. And also, um, it does have a um, loading indicator, which I can use to show that uh, it's doing something, right? So the user is not guessing if something's happening or not. So what I'm going to do is just simply Duplicate one of the texts. Um, all right, and I'm going to bind this loading indicator. I'm going to say if it's true, and say loading. Otherwise, say load complete. Again, this is this is very crude because it would also say load complete before. It, it starts loading if, if that situation ever occurs, but for our 
purposes here will do just fine. So let's give it a shot. Um, let's pick another company. All right, so you see it's loading. So it, there we go, load complete. It failed to obtain the data. That's kind of interesting. So let's see what happened. 503, service unavailable. Well, that's just great. Um, that's what happens with free API, I suppose. So let's try something else. Oh, there it is. Okay, this one loaded fine. Uh, let's go back to this one. Maybe this company was pulled from the market while we were building this. Oh, never mind. Worked this time. So this was a server fluke on the, on their side. Okay, so as you can see, we have a somewhat of a project going, right? So we have uh, biggest day movers for today. Um, we can explore each, get information about the company, and get uh, some values. There was one last item that I wanted to add to our project uh, because our API section has get chart option. I have not explored that yet. I'm really interested in seeing what it returns. So let's go ahead and try to get it. So um, this has more query parameters. Um, so let's copy the endpoint. So what I'm going to do is go back here. I'm going to copy this whole setup, duplicate it. I'm going to turn off auto run for now so it doesn't waste my, this is free, free access and it has 500 calls limit. So I don't want to run out of my limit before I'm done with the lesson here. Uh, so I'm going to paste um, the endpoint here. Right, and I'm gonna construct a few more query parameters. So language and region stay, symbol stays, but there was another one, um, range 1D. So we need to add a range and one day I think is just fine for us. And interval, right, interval 5M, range 1D. So let's just keep those uh, settings. I don't think they care what order they're in. So let's just do uh, range. And interval 1D, interval 5M. And here I'm going to end range equals range and interval equals int. I think that should do. Let's go ahead and run it. Did it work? Did it work? Oh, it worked. Okay, something worked. So I'm going to copy this and bring it to our um, JSON parser just to explore it a bit so I don't have to guess what's where. Okay, tree chart result, zero meta, timestamp. Okay, so this has timestamps and quotes. Wow, this is going to take a lot of parsing because timestamps are easy. However, um, associating, associating them with data will take some scripting probably. Well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe we can do this um, in a quick way. So let's try this. Um, so first we need to get timestamp, which is going to be chart.result dot timestamp. So let's do that. So JSON parser. Char dot result dot timestamp. I spelled something. Let's try this. I uh, chart dot result. Oops. Chart that result. Oh, object zero timestamp. So I can go that far. Maybe I can. Let's try this. I don't know if this is going to work. Oh, okay. It worked, seems like. There we go. Okay. So we got our timestamps. All right. Um, now let's let's try to get our data. Uh, 
So this is going to be a little bit more complicated. So chart.result.zero.indicators.quote.zero.close.close. Okay, so chart.result.zero.indicators. So let me just take a bit at a time so I don't uh, chart result at zero dot indicators right. and dot quote dot zero dot quote element zero dot close. Bam, okay, we got something here. So now what I'm gonna do is call, do column mapping. I'm gonna remap this column. So because it's called value, I'm gonna make it, uh, I'm gonna call it timestamp TS from value. Uh, this one stays as is. I'm gonna do the join, All right? So I'm gonna do join these two tables, right? And uh, it's left join is fine. Um, they're gonna be joined in a row, basically just a number of rows. And that gives us timestamp and the value. So we should be able to plot this. So let's go ahead, add the chart to our um, area here. And so this whole bottom section is going to be the chart. Uh, and we will have an episode on charts. There's a lot to be said about charts and chart options. But for now, just drag this column. We want to plot to the chart. Uh, we're going to say that our um, date time axis is TS. And our linear axis is values. Fine with that. Let's do area series. Excuse my dog. She is sensing a mailman. And there we go. And we have a chart. So we're done. Awesome. All right. So we just need to apply just a bit of style into this chart. So it's legible. Um, at least we need to make text color darker so it stands out against the background. And maybe axis lines a little bit more visible as well. Um, again, the, the, there are literally dozens of styling, if not hundreds of styling options. So we're not gonna, you know, just try and cover them all. Just change some basics so it's a little bit usable. Um, so as you can see, the dates are not being displayed properly. Um, that's because, um, actually that's a good point. So the reason that's happening is because they use uh, they, they don't use milliseconds epoch time, they use seconds epoch time. So the chart does not understand them as dates. So what we need to do is add three more zeros to the end of them. So, uh, so rather than TS uh, just coming from value directly, it's going to come from value. So I first have to convert it to a string because I want to add three zero characters rather than add zero to a number and do math. Right? And then let's do zero, zero, zero. There we go. So now, as you can see, chart immediately recognize those as, well, as dates. And our chart looks a lot better now. So uh, I'm not gonna go any further styling this chart. The last element that I want to show in here has to do with authorization. Now, this API does not require any, but what do you do with the ones that do? Um, so there are several types of authorization you, would, you may run into. I can't possibly cover them all because some intricate ways are controlled by the server, uh, but a very common one is basic, right? So when you deal with basic authorization, let me just copy this and turn off auto run so we don't run API. So when you deal with basic authorization, first of all, it's a header property. Uh, and 
and it's pretty easy to set up. So the syntax is simple enough. So in addition to any other uh, header elements that you have, uh, you would have a header component called, uh, authorization equals basic, right? Um, and then followed by space and uh, base64 encoded username and password, right? And so what I want to show is how to do, how to get that. Right? Uh, there are the utilities online to do that, uh, to, you know, to do base64 encoding. Uh, I personally stay away from those because you never know if someone's storing these combinations and then we'll try them somewhere at some point. So you can do it here. So in the script, Right. Um, so I'm going to add two parameters, two, two properties to my script. Uh, username and password. I'm only doing this to make it this bit more reusable. Right. And my script will be very simple. So add that username. So that's the value of username plus colon plus add dot password, right? So this creates a string of username and password separated by a column, and then encode base64, this, right? And all of that needs to be returned, okay? Done, so auto run, it's gonna error out when, obviously when there's no password. Uh, when there is a password, so let's do username user and password will be, uh, Bingo, right? So, oops, on missing bra braces here, parentheses. Otherwise, it only encodes the password. There, there. So it gives you this, uh, you know, base sixty four code username and password. You just copy that um, and use it in your header uh, as such. And of course, you have to do and and then the rest of your header. And that's it. Or to maintain convention, let's just use and, and in the beginning of every header um, component. So there, uh, this would give you, basically will allow you to do use basic authorization with your web call uh, and send a username and password as basically basic support encoded data. Uh, other methods include tokens, and those work. Again, uh, there are you, you know there are rules on how to create these headers. So you know the, somewhere in the header you would have parameter called token, and then they would followed by a token, right, and so on. So all these rules are typically written out in documentation for whatever API you're trying to use, right. As long as you remember that the syntax for the header here is basically uh, name equals value, right, or component equals value, and then and percent sign connecting basically uh, multiple header parameters, right, no spaces there. Um, one more typical item you would find in the header, again, for some reason not required for this API, but you would all very often find uh, 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 is it replicate, uh, is it, um, content type content dash type equals application slash JSON, right? That's a very common header that you would always, almost always find required. Um, so, and uh, I think that's it. Uh, really, I, I don't think anything else really stands out as something common and universal enough to include in this lesson. And we're already running so somewhat long. I'll see if I can edit some of this uh, to shorten it up a bit, but uh, that's it. So this gives you, I think, uh, excellent tools to fetch external data and build your applications where you can mesh some of the data, your local data and uh, third-party data and run logic and interconnect the two and so on.